Do you want a paper copy? <clears throat> Do you want Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Dole Institute on this first Wednesday in four weeks where we haven't been threatened by some kind of weather. So uh, what a great way to kick off our spring uh, discussion group series. Uh, we're so thrilled that Ethan Corson is here with us uh, for the next few weeks uh, and so glad to see so many of you here. Um, my name is Audrey Coleman. I'm the assistant, uh, sorry, assistant director and senior archivist here at the Institute. Um, I work primarily uh, in the museum field, but uh, it was great to meet Ethan um, last fall uh, when he came to, to campus. And I know he's been talking with Bill and building this great program uh, since it's been about a year since you've been developing it. So really thrilled to have Ethan. A few notes on his, his career. He's most recently uh, served as the executive director of the Kansas Democratic Party. Uh, and he's been ba selected as a fellow based on his extensive work for the U.S. Department of Commerce. He was a senior advisor to the former U.S. Secretary of Commerce, Penny Pritzker, and later chief of staff for the International Trade Administration. Uh, and he was a great connection, uh, was recommended to us by one of our very first fellows, Stephen Jakes. So uh, he's got, he's got, he comes on, on good recommendation, no pressure. Uh, we know this is going to be uh, just fabulous. And I'll let Ethan uh, introduce his guest here in a moment. Um, at the conclusion of the discussion, um, those of you who have visited the Dole Institute, you'll be familiar with our Q&A uh, procedure. Um, when you, Ethan will, will, will mediate the, the Q&A, you'll want to wait for a student to come to you with a microphone. Please stand and ask your question into the mic so that we can get that on our recording and our live feed. And uh, without further ado, I think that's all the points I need to, the finer points before we get started. Ethan, great to see you again. Uh, good luck, and, and here's to a great few weeks. Thanks. an important issue like international trade in a nonpartisan and non-ideological way and hopefully we can all leave this discussion group at the end with a better understanding of what I think is such an important topic. Um, I want to get into our conversation with our distinguished guests but first I want to briefly give you an overview of the discussion group and what to look forward to these next six weeks. Um, so when we're talking about international trade I think what we're really trying to answer is the question of what is America's role in the world in the 21st century? So there are really three ways that the U.S. interacts with the rest of the world. The first is militarily, and the second is diplomatically, and the third way, and the way that I would argue is probably the least well understood, is through the trade and commerce that American businesses do every day with countries around the world. It's, it's the soybeans that Kansas farmers grow, and sell to China. It's a Ford Explorer that most of them are assembled in Chicago and sent all around the world to be sold there. The iPhones that are in your pockets now and, and that I know you'll probably start checking if this introduction goes on much longer, uh, those are manufactured in China and, and sent to the US to be sold here. So it's something that, that touches all of our lives but I think is not well understood by the majority of us and I hope that through these discussion groups, we can really unpack this issue at, and I'll leave with, with a better understanding. So where I want to start the discussion group is by talking with our guest today, Scott Handler, about sort of the big ideas that drove U.S. trade policy 
in the, the post-World War II era and, and then up through the Obama administration. Next week, we're going to have a really great guest, Arun Vekantaraman, who was the first director of policy at the International Trade Administration. He's going to come on February 20th, and we'll pick up with Arun where Scott and I will conclude today, and Arun will talk to us about how we still have a bipartisan consensus around trade, but it's actually gone 180 degrees in the opposite direction, where now both parties are, are fundamentally against free trade. On February 27th, we'll talk to Jordan Haas, who as Director of Legislative and Intergovernmental Affairs at the International Trade Administration, played a critical role in advancing the Obama administration's trade agenda through Congress. And he's gonna to talk to us about what it was like to talk to and work with members of Congress uh, on these issues of international trade a and why each successive Congress, I would argue, has gotten more and more protectionist. At our March 6th discussion group, we're gonna to talk to Atman Trivedi, who was the former senior director for policy in global markets at the International Trade Administration. And he's going to talk about the Trump administration's philosophy when it comes to trade, some of the decisions that they've made, and the results that we've experienced in the first two years of the Trump administration's um, trade policy. So a after we take a week off for spring break, uh, I won't be taking a week off, but a lot of you will be taking a week off for spring break. We'll pick up on March 20th with, with what I think will be a really interesting session. We're going to talk to Mike Matson, who's the Director of Industry Affairs and development at the Kansas Farm Bureau. And so what we're gonna do in that session is really bring this topic of trade back home to Kansas. And we're gonna talk about the effect that trade policy has on Kansas's farmers and ranchers in particular. Our March 27th session is gonna be really interesting. We're gonna to talk to Megan Grube, who's the former director of speech writing at the US Department of Commerce. We're gonna talk about how narratives about trade, pro-trade, anti-trade, about how those have shaped public opinion on this issue. And then finally on April 3rd, we're gonna conclude our discussion group by talking with Paul Paquato, former Assistant Secretary for Enforcement and Compliance at the US Department of Commerce, about how trade agreements are enforced once they're entered into. Um, but without further ado, I want to introduce today's guest and then jump into our discussion. Um, we will be, uh, Scott and I will talk for about 45-ish minutes, and then we'll take your questions. So um, really excited to hear from you and, and make this interactive. So Scott and I worked together at the U.S. Department of Commerce, where Scott was a White House fellow and a special advisor to the U.S. Secretary of Commerce, Penny Pritzker. Scott served for 22 years as an Army officer including as a professor and director of the International Relations Program at the U.S. Military Academy at West Point. He served as second in command of a cyber battalion that he helped create and grow from 20 to over 450 persons, tasked with conducting a full spectrum of cyberspace operations. He also served as senior advisor to the commander of the U.S. National Mission, Cyber National Mission Force, as special assistant to the senior leadership team that created U.S. Cyber Command, and as special assistant to two commanding generals of the Multinational Security Transition Command, Iraq. Scott is currently the Chief Information Security Officer and Head of Partnerships at Wirewheel, a privacy technology company that helps companies manage their data privacy practices and comply with data regulations. Scott was a Council on Foreign Relations term member and is currently a fellow in New America's Cybersecurity Initiative. He holds a BS from the US Military Academy, a master's degree in urban regional planning from the University of Hawaii at Manoa, where he was an East-West fellow, and a PhD in political science from Stanford University. So it's, welcome Scott Handler. Thanks, Ethan. Thanks. Um, I just wanted to say thanks to Audrey, the Dole Institute, Ethan for bringing me here, um, everybody for coming out. Um, and I enjoy looking forward to the conversation. Um, so it, we, Scott and I were talking a little bit before this, and uh, you had a really interesting story about Bob Dole that I never would have known before. Do you, do you mind sharing that? It's really interesting. <laughs> 
So it was interesting walking in and thinking about it. I didn't think about it until I actually walked in and we were standing there looking at the flag. But I moved to Miami when I was 12 years old with my family and we grew up in New Jersey before then. And I was interested in politics, but didn't know really why or anything else. And the real estate broker that sold her house happened to be the Miami-Dade chair or Miami-Dade County chair for the Dole campaign. And 1986 when we moved there for the 88 campaign for president and so said why don't you join the campaign i didn't even really know who bob dole was to be honest you know 12 years old or why i was like being a republican or anything else but hey um at that time um but so i joined the dole campaign got there doing mailers knocking door to door went to an event with um senator dole at um this big Cuban restaurant in Miami that everybody goes to in order to meet with the Cuban community um, and a bunch of other events. So then I was thinking full circle. And then part of that also was Al Haig became a surrogate for Bob Dole during that campaign and did a couple of events in Miami when Al Haig came down. And that was the first that I really started to hear about and think about West Point, which eventually ended up at. So it was an interesting circle of life coming here and not <laughs> realizing. But. Well, that's a, that's a really interesting thing. I mean, I want to talk to you a little more. I, I, about how did you decide to go to West Point? And then when you went there as an 18 year old cadet, what did you think that you were gonna do for a career? Yeah, so, so my route to West Point was a little bit circuitous too because I actually didn't go when I was 18. I didn't go until I was 22. I was enlisted in the army for four years before I went to West Point and I made it into West Point. There's an age cutoff of when you can get into. So I was the third oldest in my class because you couldn't be 22 when you entered the academy. Now they upped it by a year, so you could be 23. But so at the time, it was February of my senior year of high school, and this was the year after, so I graduated in 92, not to date myself, but so um, it was the year after the first Gulf War, and there was just a bunch of different things, though, that I felt one, a draw to public service was one component to it. Another component was a sense of adventure, improving something of my own outside of what my comfort zone was. And then there was another part is that, I mean, I grew up in a pretty middle class family. I mean, we were comfortable enough, but also though my parents didn't make enough to pay for college for the things that I was going to. And so the parts that I considered, and I didn't qualify for any financial aid because growing up in Miami, I spent a lot of time sailing. So my grades weren't necessarily the best. Um, and so, I didn't qualify for those, so then I was at the stage of, okay, my parents would take on debt or I would take on debt, and so decided what can I do to look at as another option, and back then the Army GI Bill College Fund was one also way that I figured I could pay for college when I got out myself and not put a burden on my parents or myself. Um, so that was, so those were the three factors that led me there, and then when I was in the Army, I was having a lot of fun. I served and learned Korean um, at a language institute in Monterey that the military has, served in Korea, and just felt like I was doing something bigger than myself. And when you think about Korea then in 93, 94, when I was there, they just had their coming out party with the Olympics in 88. They were still not an OECD country yet. So you think of today as South Korea is this major, you know, industrial power that is there and think of the technologies that they have and talks about trade, you know, it gets mm -hmm. to now seeing it, right, of the impact that trade can have and different state policies around trade. We have a major trade agreement with South Korea. Yeah. And South Korea traded a major trade agreement and at the time, like in the late 70s, it wasn't until the mid 70s that South Korea surpassed North Korea in the sense of economic development standards. So, I mean, it was still an emerging country. And so when going out and helping do public service and different ways of volunteer work and teaching English or working in orphanages, I just felt like I was doing something bigger than myself. So then I decided I wanted to still do it. And one of my commanders said, hey, you're young enough or you should go to college, become an officer, because there was different roles and responsibilities that I was interested in that even though I enjoyed being enlisted and there was tremendous responsibilities there, there was different ones that you can have and gain as an experience as an officer. So then applied, um, took me two times to apply, I didn't get into West Point the first time, going back to the grades where I didn't apply myself. Um, and then the second time after I took some college classes at night to prove I could actually handle the math and English and then ended up in um, West Point. And then I just thought I was gonna get out after five years, go into business, and then 22 years later, then decided to get out. Yeah. Um, oh, wow. Well, I mean, you've had a fascinating career. You've worked at the highest levels of government, academia, now in the private sector, in the military. So uh, talk a little bit about each of these different experiences and, and what you took away from them that helped you grow professionally. It was, I mean, like you said, in talking about like hearing even the resume, like I'm not used to even hearing it or other parts and I try to avoid looking at, but I've had a really crazy windy path. So if anybody ever says to you, okay, here's the way you get from A to B, in the military, there's a clear pathway that you have to get to A to B. Okay, you wanna be 
going from your next position to the next position and move up in higher responsibility. And there's certain, I wouldn't say check blocks, but you have to do certain positions, like you're a platoon leader, you're a company commander, you're an executive officer, you're a battalion commander, and these certain jobs you have to do, and you do certain things along the way. I did everything I needed to do for those points, but then from some of the lessons I learned from different leaders along the way that I could talk about was you have to fill in and self-develop sometimes where institutions won't develop you. So I took some risks along the way of doing things that then I enjoyed what I was doing, but one thing led to another that I never expected. So like doing that urban regional planning degree, I did that right out of West Point under a fellowship. And the reason I did it was because in 2000, when I graduated- Not just because it was in Hawaii. Not just because it was in Hawaii. I was actually supposed to go to Germany where I wanted to go. It was because, but I mean, Hawaii didn't hurt, right? Yeah. <laughs> but so, but you put yourself back in 2000 and it was pre 9-11. And then the issue for the military was the Balkans. And it was, everything was about urban warfare or operations other than war was everybody talked about. So I was like, okay, if I'm gonna end up potentially as an acting mayor of a village in the Balkans, I might as well understand how economic and regional development work and how a city works and how you actually plan and do those things. And then I ended up not in the Balkans because 9-11 happened while I was there. So I saw that one of my friends called and watched the second plane go in. And then like, obviously the world changed after that, but then, when I ended up working for, so uh, later on, I worked for General Petraeus when he was the commander of Multinational Security Transition Command Iraq. And part of the reason that I was asked to go work for him, even though I had no idea who he even was when I got pulled into a unit, was that fellowship that I did and the, the urban planning background because of the issues that they were dealing with in Iraq. But then my focus was on regional development stuff. And that's what he focused on when he was a division commander in Mosul in northern Iraq. So it was just like things that you never would have expected sort of pieced together. Um, and each of those built different things. So in the military, the first thing when I was enlisted, like I think of, and I know this was like a question that you were gonna probably get to of, the other was one of my first squad leaders when I was enlisted. I mean, the idea of one, taking care of like your soldiers and subordinates, accepting responsibility though for your actions and not blaming others, right, was a big thing that I learned from the military side is okay, how do you accept, right, the ownership of the things and for your team, you accept the failures or the fallbacks of your team, but you give success to the team members and a guy who really lived that. Time management, um, excellence, right, so this view that pursuit of excellence and always pushing yourself beyond what you think your own limits are. And so you think about whether you work out, right? You plateau at some point and then you need to change your workout routine in order to move to another level. So how do you do that even intellectually or other parts? Mm -hmm. And was exposed to people who did that. Mm -hmm. um, so I would say like from the military, that was one of the pieces that I gained, but then <clears throat> all those tools helped me as I was then suddenly thrust into, so I did the normal military stuff as a platoon leader back in Korea in the DMZ at that time, that stuff played out, but then the intellectual development part. So when I worked for General Petraeus and then his successor was General Dempsey, who ended up becoming the chairman of Joint Chiefs, and it was working for these two guys back to back who were classmates and seeing how they both very different leadership styles. So that was the other thing about the military, seeing how adapting to different situations, which has still helped me when we were in commerce or in the business world, how do you adapt your leadership style to the people that you're with? Um, but the interesting thing with them and the differences of they were was both though believed in the value of being a soldier, statesman, scholar, and that you had to self-develop in order to fill the gaps that you would need because especially the role of the military is to advise civilian leaders in our country of decisions when they serve at that level. And so how do you provide the best military advice is you have to understand these other tools of power that are out there. And you're not necessarily gonna get it if you just go through just the training that you're given and you have to develop a little bit more. And then how do you understand also the incentives and be able to provide your bosses or others, what they need and the information. So always being prepared. It was an unbelievable amount of relentless preparation and focus on whatever they prepared to be able to explain an issue in a very succinct manner that um, developed from them, which was interesting, which then led into even when we were in commerce. So working for Secretary Pritzker's, you know, one or two pages, mm -hmm. right, to then be able to have a later conversation. How can you be extremely concise but to the point, right, it's not just, okay, you write something short, you have to use like every word extremely valuably that you have, so like writing being such an important skill to have and grow and develop in anything that you do. So there's all these things along the way and doing the PhD just helped add those skill sets of how do you take a ton of information at once, assimilate it, 
and get it down a way again to be able to simply explain something. Um, so all those things have just built for me, I'd mm -hmm. say, along the way. And each one has provided different unique experiences. Mm -hmm. Although what I just did was a long-winded way of saying all of those, right? It, but trying to capture 22-year career in that point. Now, I want to follow up on one thing, because we had a shared experience with somebody who I regard yeah. as, as a really great leader, Secretary Pritzker, yeah. somebody who's been a leader across business, phil phil philanthropy, in the private sector, in government. What did you, what did you take away from learning and, and being able to work for her? Yeah, so working for Penny, I mean, that was like one of the things, right? So she wanted to be called Penny, not like Secretary Pritzker. I mean, there was a certain part of the humility to it. You always knew she was the boss. Right, so there was never a question of who was in charge, but even I was fortunate enough to work with great military leaders, like you mentioned, she stood out in different ways. And the things that I really took away from working with her was the acceptance of calculated risk, right? So she was very much about taking risk and doing things in order to try to have an outsized impact but it had to be smart and calculated, right? Not just, okay, taking stupid risk, right? And so there were certain parameters around doing that. The part of taking from her experience, even around from being in the startups, so starting five startups of her own, right? And being in the business world before coming in, the idea of plan, execute, and iterate. So how do you pilot things and then scale? Try it, see what works. If it doesn't, move on to the next one, knowing that failure is part of it and her willingness to accept the failure of those pilot iterations. And then once you get the model that works, then let's scale it and move it up. Mm -hmm. So like some of the things we did to promote entrepreneurship abroad, which was about 21st century trade, was how do you build a supply chain that for the future, people were gonna need things, where others thought supporting entrepreneurs was counter to American trade, right? Why would you build a business in another country that could compete with ours? which was very short-sighted, right, versus the long-term view, which is also what she had. It was like seeing nth order effects down the road, not just what are the first, second, third things, but would look at the fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth order effects and where it would go. Then the last thing I learned from her of seeing on the side, and this was what actually, I think, really sparked my desire. Like, every time I had a chance to get out of the military, I always affirmatively stayed in. I would find a job on the outside, but I chose to stay in. And what I saw from her was she was able to have an outsized impact outside of government. Mm -hmm. And I don't even know, like, did she have more of an impact on her private life through the philanthropy and other things that she did than she did in government, right? Because mm -hmm. how many of those things are lasting or being torn apart, right, in the different ways? But, um, but she was an amazingly, I mean, empathetic leader, listened to different points. Um, so, yeah. I think yeah. it was very fortunate, as you know, to I mean, work with her. The thing I took away from her in part was just that there are also just no shortcuts. She no. was rel relentlessly Relentless. prepared, worked harder than any of yeah. us, read, I mean, really understood the issues. I think sometimes we think of leaders or people who have some degree of personal charisma or yeah. they can go in, and, and, and certainly she had that, but she also knew the substance. Yeah. It was not, give me a couple talking points, I'll sound like I know what I'm talking about. It was, I really want to deeply understand this yeah. issue. Well, I mean, thinking about like the briefing books, right, of everything else, like every night she took home a page, you know, a, anywhere from 250 to 500 page binder of materials on the topics and the preparation for it. And I think that went to the same thing that I saw with General Betrayas and General Dempsey, that relentless preparation and always being prepared with information and data to support, not just a mere opinion about something and to be able to walk in and win the argument based on that was... Mm -hmm. Yeah. It, it, you know, you and I probably both got those calls. I would get calls from her, from her chief of staff at 10, 10.30 at night because she was going through her briefing book and had a question about a memo, wanted to yeah. dig deeper on something. And then I would see her on my way to work in the morning running with her security detail at like 6 a.m. I mean, it was just a, an incredible pace that, that she was able to, to keep. And so I, I want to turn to, to trade for, for a little bit because um, that's obviously why we're, why we're here. But so uh, today I really want to talk about the intellectual concepts and the historical context that, that helped shape American trade policy in, in the years after World War II. So at the same time that the U.S. was leading the way in forming things like NATO, the United Nations, it was also leading the way in, in forming, uh, coming to the consensus on the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade, which was meant to expand mm -hmm. international trade. So why at this time we're, we're the world's biggest economy, were the world's sole superpower. Why were these policymakers really focused on this idea of promoting U.S. trade and commerce with other nations? 
So I think in stepping back, right, and thinking about why they would want to promote trade or other part of it is you take, right, this post-World War II period where you have so much destruction that took place, right? So you think about the world's industrial base is largely destroyed, but you're also looking at, as you mentioned, and I'll come back to those different institutions that were developing around the same time, is that how do we prevent another world war, right, was in everybody's mind. And so there were political components to it, there were security components to it, and there were economic components to it. And we'll focus here on the economic, but not to separate out, right, of setting up these different institutions, and I'll define an institution just for our own argument here as a set of rules, norms, decision-making procedures, and the reason that you have an institution is in the international system is there's a state of anarchy that exists, right? That there is no overarching authority that exists like the state that can enforce anything. So you need some different rules and norms that are there, and then the mechanisms to then try to enforce through that institution violations of what those norms and rules are. And so that belief in institutionalism starts rising around that period of what can we put the structures in place to prevent the thing structurally that led to World War II? And so you have NATO's not developed yet, but you start having military alliances, and the U.S. is still stationed in these countries that are taking place, right? But it's happening by 1950. And to provide a security backdrop, right? Because you still have even the stuff with the Soviet Union starting to emerge and the elements that are there. So you need a security backdrop to it. So you think about elements of power would be one way of framework of doing it is, uh, is this dime framework, diplomatic, informational, military, and economic elements of national power. And back then, they were all seen seamlessly together. Now we're in a period where a lot of them have been pulled apart and looked at individually. But so all of it was seen as one. And so even on the economic side, it wasn't just about trade, right? So the Brenton Woods institutions, so the meeting that took place in 1947 that established the Brenton Woods institutions, was about all economic interaction internationally is what these institutions were about. So there were supposed to be three institutions that were under discussion at the Brenton Woods. The first one, European Bank of Reconstruction and Development, which is the World Bank Group today, was focused on microeconomic issues about development assistance, loans, ways to actually rebuild, right, and reconstruct what was there. And you now have all these multilateral development banks and for every region of the world that developed out of that. Then you had the IMF, the International Monetary Fund, that grows out of Brenton Woods, which everybody agreed to, and it was the idea of how do you control monetary and financial affairs, because the issue was with trade, you have to worry also about exchange rates. And so exchange rate stability was a major mechanism of how do you control trade, because if people are manipulating exchange rates and there's lack of stability around it, it also leads to distortions of that economic experience or transactions that can take place. And then where they got stuck was actually they tried to create an institution called the International Trade Organization. And so the International Trade Organization actually was still birthed at the Bretton Woods Institution because they couldn't come to different agreements around how do we actually structure tariffs, multi mm -hmm. or most favored nation status, the ideas that end up becoming enshrined around trade agreements of reciprocity and non-discrimination, which we can talk about. But then you have the GATT, which is sort of a light version because they're like, we really need this around trade after it failed at Brenton Woods, but it's still considered one of the Brenton Woods institutions that evolved from there. But so you have the general agreement on tariffs and trade that then come into being, which is a lighter version of the ITO. It doesn't have the same dispute resolution mechanisms. It was meant to harmonize things. So it was the best agreement you can get multilaterally at the time of the different powers that were there. Then it evolves into the World Trade Organization, which then emerges right in 95, or I think right in 95. Mm -hmm. um, that finally comes after some successive negotiation rounds of the different trade rounds that take place that leads to the WTO, which is almost like what was envisioned for the ITO back in 47. So we, what we call the ITO is like the League of Nations of... Uh... Yeah, that's a good <laughs> way, yeah, actually. Yeah. Uh, so uh, how did this view of trade that was proposed post-World War II... I mean, we'd seen trade before for centuries, but how was it different in, in compared to a more mercantilist approach? And, and if you could define mercantilism and how this approach that the U.S. took and, and led was different than previous approaches we'd seen. Yeah. 
so this idea, so liberalism, and so I'm gonna use it, liberalism with a small L and thinking about these institutions and free trade and the concept of free trade, not in the current modern parlance of liberalism, right? It's the opening of something. And so the basic part of classical economics that was taking place around liberalism and the arguments for trade, you can go back to like David Ricardo and the idea of competitive or comparative advantage. And so the idea is between opportunity cost and your lowest opportunity cost, you should be able to maximize where you produce something. And so there's something that even though you may be good at producing two products, so take mm -hmm. wine and cheese in France and in Switzerland, one will have an opportunity cost that's higher than the other, so you should then produce the one that you're better at and you have the better margin, and you increase your overall welfare by trade, where you would have one static line, you're able to expand that consumer frontier, production frontier that you can have, and you can consume more goods for it. And that's the idea behind free trade, is by being able to trade with other people on this basis of comparative advantage, you can increase individual welfare, and individual welfare defined by the idea of a more efficient use of the markets, as well as better quality of life or standard of living, standard of living being defined by being able to consume more. And so that was the prevailing idea that was really going on from Adam Smith forward, right, with the idea, and we, I mean, not gonna go into details, right, but so Adam Smith forward from same time, 18th century, that that's moving on. But then what you have from this is, they so Britain, right, reaches their pinnacle. Then they decide with the repeal of the Corn Laws, which was a tariff-based system that they had, they wanted to promote free trade. And they started to aggressively promote free trade upon others because it was in their interest, when this was, will get us to mercantilism mm -hmm. in a second. And so then you have the idea of mercantilism as a sort of, even though it existed before because it was about power, is starts to emerge and so it comes out of Germany really and the German Enlightenment counter to the Anglo-French Enlightenment ideas toward liberalism and so this guy Frederick List in Germany in the US it even happened before that because Alexander Hamilton was a classical mercantilist. So even though we think of Jefferson won the day and trade policy, really actually Hamilton, even though it's not the story that's told in the play, right? Hamilton was a mercantilist. Um, he produced a report on manufacturers and the idea was, and so what List and Hamilton and some of the philosophies behind it were, it's not about the market determining the efficient use of resources and it's not about consumption. Rather than consumption, it's about production because production is what allows a state to have power and in the international system, you're gonna have to have power vis-a-vis -vis other countries and it is a zero-sum world, right? So it goes to realism for the international relations or political scientists that are out there, right? There's this zero-sum world that exists from the view of point of a mercantilist and unless you have productive capacity which allows you to gain employment for your people and, and guarantees that you have the goods you need to survive and not be dependent upon others, you're opening yourself up to this dependency that will weaken you as a state vis-a-vis -vis others. Mm -hmm. So mercantilism was our policy up until pretty much that we were in a nebulous period between World War I and World War II, but then we shifted when we were the strongest person and the biggest one that was there. From a mercantilist standpoint, they'll say, yeah, you go to a liberal policy when you're the top of the block because that's what's gonna help you by opening trade, you're gonna do it. Different, another difference is, a liberal doesn't care, again, small L liberal, right, in that view of institutionalists or anything else, doesn't care about the balance of trade. And when I say balance of trade, I mean, are you importing or exporting more goods? If you have a surplus of trade, that means that you export more than you import. That's what a mercantilist wants, because that's a sign of your power, is that you have a trade surplus. If you have a trade deficit, it means that you're beholden to others and you're potentially dependent upon them, and it's a risk to your power and your security. So there's a difference there between them on the way that they view balance of trade. We can talk about just to, I mean, hit it up, but um, I mean, one other viewpoint and perspective around this time is, and it's because of, right, the Soviet Union being there, was if you take, say, neo-Marxism, radical theories, or structural theories, and the view that it's not just about, okay, whether it's about wealth creation and aggregately is, in the liberal view, if you increase aggregate welfare of individual, or individual welfare, then it'll take place of aggregate welfare and it'll all be better off. You have that power view for the mercantilists, then from the structuralist or neo-marxist view, it's about really inequality and workers' rights. And so how do you create a system that minimizes income inequality? And so you have even the common turn rising as an alternative institution that some people dismiss or other things that are there. 
and but you still have this though idea of the core versus periphery and their argument would be that the only reason you have a liberal trade policy or promote free trade is to sub subjugate those in the periphery rather than the core and exploit the workers that are there and create further inequality so those would be sort of the three main you know philosophical views that you have and then start to emerge right so you have the dominance as you say after this period and whether you were a mercantilist or a liberal both supported at that time free trade mm -hmm. so in a way they were both again on that same side and it didn't matter post-world war ii because even if you were someone who thought in state power the u.s was the power and you want to maintain that position so we should promote free trade so they supported the same policies that someone was doing it from the liberal standpoint of let's increase aggregate welfare would have so there was mm -hmm. that consensus that existed so it really didn't even matter which perspective you came from mm -hmm. and Let's talk though. I mean, no, no policy has a hundred percent agreement. So there were obviously dissenters during this time period. Yep. Walk us through some of the arguments that were made by the folks who who were dissenting from this. And again, I would I would agree that we had a general pro free trade consensus. But there were dissenters: Pat Buchanan, Ross Perot. Uh, the thing that I think is interesting about President Trump is he's he's been a Democrat at times. He's been a Reform Party. He's been a Republican. He's had different views on a lot of issues. But even going back to some of his his first most public uh, comments, and you can go back. There's this. You can Google and find it. But there's a 1987 letter to America that he put in the Boston Globe, the New York Times, the Washington Post, laying out essentially the exact same views on trade that he holds today. It is it is the one issue that he's been remarkably consistent on. So what were some of the arguments that were being made by dissenters from this liberal international order uh, with, with respect to trade? And how should we weigh those arguments? Yeah, so, I mean, I think that it comes from, there's a couple of things around to unpack a little bit is trade creates winners and losers, right? Bottom line, right? And so looking at it, what's that? Sorry, that trade, there's winners and losers that come from trade. Right? And so that's just a fact of that situation. So depending on how you look at those winners and losers, shapes the way of then the type of dissent that you may have or criticality of the type of policy of free trade. One thing is free trade is a complete misnomer anyway. It's never really free trade, right? It's what do you against? I mean, we even tried to make that statement before Donald Trump started saying fair trade agreements mm -hmm. was even in the Obama administration and trying to sell the trade, the trans or the Trans-Pacific Partnership was about trying to create fairer trade, right? Because there's still tariffs. So it doesn't mean there is no trade agreement that actually almost basically eliminates tariffs unless it's like custom union or some free trade agreement I mean zones but there's still tariffs even between the US and Mexico and Canada over goods it's just you set what the tariff level is um, but the dissent around it is okay jobs are being lost and it's a fact there will be jobs lost right but then the question is that you'll hear from an you know maybe an economic argument around it so let's take Ross Perot right the job or the sucking chest the giant wound, sucking sound the giant sucking sound that's going to happen if NAFTA goes into place and all the jobs are going to move to Mexico well there's a certain reality to a certain part so it depends on how you're defining it so I don't know if anybody's seen like the Akira Kurosawa movie um, was it not Roshimbo or whatever but there's like there's this crime that takes place, four different people watch it, and they all have a different perspective, and it's hard to get to what the truth is. And that's sort of like the, the way that this plays out, right? It depends on the angle that you look at it. In aggregate, overall welfare, you can make the argument that overall welfare has increased. So you can look at, say, NAFTA as an example. Overall trade between the three different partners who are part of it, the US, Mexico, and Canada, has increased, right, within the zone that is there. GDP as overall, right, isn't, whether it's now this gets to the question of causality versus correlation, right? Overall GDP has increased, but there's a lot of other things that have happened around the world, although it stayed same, the ratio between US and Mexico from the time it went into effect to, to what it is today, even though now the US is 60,000 and it's 10,000 GDP per capita in Mexico, so one sixth basically of the US's GDP per capita, that's exactly the ratio it was. It was 4,000 versus 24,000 when NAFTA went into effect. But you have this part of the job sucking thing that came in, or blood sucking, whatever it was, that 350,000 American car workers were laid off since NAFTA went into effect. 450,000 jobs were created in the Mexican automotive industry. Right? Whether that was the whole thing that led to the Mex US jobs going to Mexico, there's still some impact that was there, whether you want to accept it or not, or which way you try to argue it. So yeah, sure, maybe overall aggregate has improved, 
but there's 350 people that are out of jobs that see Mexico as the reason, right? And most of it was, and especially from NAFTA, from that period was college ed, non-college educated employees competing with low wage jobs were the ones that were most affected by the approximately 600,000 jobs that seemed to have potentially moved to Mexico during that period, right? So for those 600,000 people, it's real. And then for, even though there may have been, there's much higher job creation in the US since NAFTA went to effect. Was it because of NAFTA? No, right? There's all these other factors. But then the issue was, there was this promise that even if you lose your job, and there was the critics come in too, was even if you lose your jobs, labor isn't as mobile as people make it out to be. Mm -hmm. And so you're not able to necessarily transition into different jobs or different sectors. So you get laid off in automotive, you didn't suddenly get a job in the internet, right, during the dot-com boom mm -hmm. that was taking place at the same time. You weren't doing it. It wasn't happening, and there was no retraining to make it take place. This is the, I'm in West Virginia. I've been a yeah. coal miner for five generations. Yeah. I'm not going to become a computer programmer, right? I mean, that's sort of yeah. that, that thing. And uh, talk a little bit about this, and, and I want to get into NAFTA that, that you mentioned. Talk a little bit about the, this phrase that, that I think about a lot, which is this idea that, that one of the challenges with trade is that there are benefits to trade, but they're diffuse, but the pain from, from trade is more acute. And, and talk about that dynamic. We all benefit a little bit from trade, but those that are hurt are hurt very acutely. So, so there's also the reverse of it too, and this is why trade is such a hard issue, right, in the sense of mobilization, because similar to like consumer things, right, so you may lose whatever sector of jobs, if it's one thing, but then there's others that grow, so yes, right, so there's gonna be acute pain to a small group of people. So that'd be the automotive sector. So say the automotive example. sector, right, in that sense, right, and the benefit aggregate welfare-wise goes across a big group, potentially, but you also have aggregate benefits, and this gets to some of the other arguments for trade and against trade, and we can talk about factor and sectoral approaches. There's also concentrated gains from trade, who have an interest in the sense of interest group lobbying, right, that also impact trade policy, where consumer interests, right, are always very diffuse, mm -hmm. and so it's harder for them to mobilize, so when you also diffuse some of the costs, Pain may be acute, but the cost can be very diffuse. And so the cost to participate to try to influence or shape policy is much higher relative to that. So in a sense of mobilizing people, it's a lot harder to mobilize bigger groups against something. Mm -hmm. But once it gets to a certain point, right, with the rise of populism on both the right and left, right. now we're seeing something different across the globe around this. Um, if that gets to the yeah. question or not. I, want to, I want to touch on two more things, and I want to take your questions. I want to touch on, on NAFTA and, the, and, and then the WTO real quick. So we're now in the midst of, of it's now with Congress as far as whether or not they're going to uh, approve the USMCA, which is the U.S.-Mexico-Canada trade agreement called oftentimes NAFTA 2.0 or, or new NAFTA. So with, with the ability to look at, at, this, at NAFTA through his, a historical lens now, Talk to us about what was the big idea behind the agreement and, and what is the legacy of NAFTA, right? How should we look back at it? Did the benefits to these three countries, did they materialize? What were the downsides? How should we look back with the advantage of hindsight at NAFTA? So I think in NAFTA, we need to look at it first more holistically. The, give us the big idea. Yeah. So then just a simple trade agreement. So think about the timing and part of where the world was, right? The peace dividend, post coral post-Cold War, and other parts that were there. But think about what was taking place, right, with the southern border and other issues. It wasn't mur merely an economic argument. So this gets to the point of where all those tools of national power coming together. The idea of these trade agreements are they are also political agreements and different purposes that are there. So Mexico, right, you have, during this period, a lot of instability in Mexico, even though it had one single party ruling for 75 years, and you can think of this like hegemonic rule that one party has over the country, there's still a lot of internal strife and political instability that's taking place within the country. And you have a lot of illegal immigration that's still taking place. So immigration was actually a major issue at the time of NAFTA's argument. The argument was create the economic opportunity in Mexico so then it'll stop the flow of illegal immigrants because if they're coming to the U.S. for economic opportunity, it will level out what those jobs are and it will prevent the flow of illegal immigrants into the U.S. because they'll have jobs that keep them back in Mexico so they don't come into the United States. Mm 
So that was actually a big part of the NAFTA argument as well, besides the economic arguments of how do we also strengthen in this peace dividend, you see the rise of the European Union. So the European Union is now solidifying because the Treaty of Rome goes into effect and you have the European community build out. They sign the Treaty of Amsterdam and they're getting ready for, or Maastricht Treaty, right? And they're getting ready to actually become the European Union and this other part. So they see this major trade block that's actually gonna grow also. And so the US and Canada, the idea was how do we actually help from the US and Canada standpoint, which are developed countries, try to help Mexico become a developed country mm -hmm. and move into that world, right, where you're gonna have that as this big European block that's just as big as the US. And as you have the economic powerhouse, right, of Germany and other things that are going on. And so even though they're slowing down a little because of reunification that's taking place, there's still a lot that's going on. So seeing that foresight of where it was going, it was just as much as a political and then also a strategic economic move in a lot of different ways. So that was part of the context for what was taking place for NAFTA. Sorry on the other part of the question. There. So that was the context. Now with the, van uh, with the advantage of hindsight, okay. Now that we're maybe moving on from NAFTA, what is the legacy of NAFTA? How should we look back at and think about, did the benefits materialize? Yep. What were the downsides? Yep. So, so one of the enduring legacies was NAFTA blew up multilateral trade agreements. So the rise of regional trade agreements. So within the WTO's charter, there's a few exceptions to the idea of reciprocity and non-discrimination. So one of the key elements of non-discrimination is this thing called most favored nation status, where you treat a country as if you treat your favored, you, you allow for the same tariff level that you do for the person you give the best tariff level. So I treat my best, anybody as my friend as I treat my best friend, basically. So if like you're my best friend and I give you 5% as my tariff, I know you, but you're a member of the WTO and our normal tariff is 15% because I give her 5%, you also get 5% by being a member of the WTO. There's two carve outs though to that MFN piece is one are regional trade agreements. So you're allowed to actually give a better tariff to another country if it's part of a regional trade agreement. So it sort of it undermines WTO in itself and it works, it, so it has this built in sort of poison pill that ends up emerging. And the other one is this idea called the general systems of preferences where you can give, and this will get us to China later, is a member can enter and you can give preferential treatment to less developed countries. So less developed countries can also get trade preferences that wouldn't be part of that MFN and would be exempted from that. But so with the regional trade agreement of building either plurilateral, meaning three or more countries or bilateral agreements, they skyrocket after NAFTA. So I mean, the US has signed almost two dozen bilateral agreements, I think are close to, in that period after NAFTA. Um, and then the move, because it was so hard to start negotiating, because WTO was the last round that succeeded. There was the Doha round that's been trumbling along for almost 18 years now and is never gonna close. The idea that every country agrees to something, there's now these diffuse interests that are competing. And so how do we gain these preferences and advantages using regional trade agreements? So it blew up the multilateral system in sort of different ways was one of the legacies of NAFTA. In the sense of the direct economic parts, there's arguments both ways. That's increased overall pieces between the US and Canada. You can argue it's the same trajectory. We're still Canada's largest trading partner. It's been expanded greatly. What did it establish, right? So a difference between a free trade zone and a customs union, they agreed to get rid of tariffs that tra travel between different goods within the US, Mexico, and Canada. So getting rid of that tariffs then increased the volume of consumption between our countries together, shifted some of the exporting around. FDI from Canada, they're still the largest foreign direct investor into the United States. Um, and then us, vice versa, so the sense of investment and where it's going more than the other parts. So maybe it accelerated and helped continue what was already starting. Um, so there's definitely positives to the overall aggregate increase, but then again, there was acute losses along the way as mm -hmm. well. And, and the last thing I'm gonna touch on before we go to questions is the World Trade Organization. It comes around in, in 1995 under President Clinton. What is the big idea behind WTO? What are they trying to accomplish <coughs> there? Yep, so WTO comes back to these two ideas as rules, norms, decision-making procedures that you can harmonize these issues right around trade to around the idea of reciprocity and um, non-discrimination. So the idea of reciprocity is I treat you as I would treat somebody else. Non-discrimination is this idea, right, that you would not harm another in the sense of 
we talked about, right, of giving somebody preferential treatment mm -hmm. to somebody else. But what you're trying to get rid of with the WTO, when they have a dispute resolution mechanism, which is different than the GATT, that you're able to then basically sue over certain violations and get remedies that are put forth if somebody violates a part of the agreement. So you have somebody that's an international, or supposed to be a unbiased arbiter of it. But so the problems that it solves around those issues are information asymmetry. So if I was to trade on our own, right, so this idea of a collective action issue is, it's in my incentive if we're as a group collectively, so I don't get cheated by somebody else to take some short-term losses potentially for longer-term gains. And so by sharing information I have about somebody who's maybe cheating or information about what I'm actually doing with others, it gives others a better view to make the markets more efficient. Mm -hmm. Then you also have people who are saying, okay, someone was violated. Then everybody collectively falls in on that punishment because I don't want to be the one that's violated in the future. So it's in my incentive in the future to also help punish those who transgress against the rules. As soon as you get away from that, then it does it. So it tries to create this cohesion around these different groups and you abide by the rules. And if somebody doesn't abide by them, then everybody shares in that punishment. So if somebody puts a tariff on as an example improperly and it wasn't allowed and the WTO rules against them. So banana wars is an example where there was different tariffs about bananas. And so Mexico or Argentina gets a special um, offset that they can put against the US. If the US doesn't abide by it, then all the other countries of the world can then accept extra tariffs that they provide to the other to mm -hmm. remedy that situation. And then China. China joins the WTO in 2001. That was controversial at the time. It remains controversial today. What is it about China joining the WTO that was controversial then and now? And what have been some of the effects of having China as a member of the WTO? So, so I mean, China, part of it was, again, this gets to political question versus economic question, right? So there was the economic arguments that they were nowhere near ready to be part of this system because they didn't liberalize their economy, right? So there are certain elements to being part of the WTO and these other institutions that you should liberalize the economy in certain ways to open yourself up. And the command structure that they had of the economy, the role of the state in every aspect of the economy, the companies that they had, the ability to price things differently, loans that the government gives to its businesses, all these things that distort the market made it, there's no way that it can compete fear, freely and fairly or other countries can compete fairly in the Chinese market or even potentially with the Chinese companies that then would be exporting under these new rules. That get the benefit of these rules. That, yeah, China yeah. would get the benefit of these rules and then foreign companies then would not even in their own home markets be able to compete fairly against China because of the distortions that exist in their market. Mm -hmm. And so the Clinton administration for a long time, there was the idea of, okay, and not just them, previous administrations, even the Bush administration, the idea of do you extend multi most favored nation status to China as a precursor even to the WTO where it was this idea of, okay, give them the same tariffs and see how they behave. But then there was the argument of, and this gets to this liberal institutionalist view, again, small L liberal, is before you can do certain things around political reform and other parts is incentivize people, right? Allow them in, open your arms to them because as they increase and their economic development improves and there are certain things around thresholds of mean GDP that there was different correlations economically about looking at of them countries start moving towards democracy and all these other things that happen once they cross certain GDP thresholds was okay, let's welcome them in, use economics as an incentive to change their behavior and this is what's gonna allow them like we've done with other countries or anything else and even though there's sometimes false analogies because we understand South Korea, Singapore, and these economic miracles and the Asian tigers differently because they really weren't open. Um, there were certain state industrial mm -hmm. policies that they had that allowed them to grow. But the idea was, okay, bring China into that fold and then they'll improve and they'll become a better player in the international system. So, so now 18 years in, 18 how years do you in. think you weigh those arguments that you, you laid out now that we have the, yeah. the, that they have been a member for 18 years what has happened? So, I mean, China clearly, I mean, I mean, the, the, the vol I mean, the vast change of the growth of their middle class, the economic opportunities they've had by becoming part of the WTO has extremely helped their economy and moved it forward. Has China progressed in some ways in their economy? Yes. Have they opened up certain things? Are companies able to compete in different ways in the Chinese market? But there's still a ton of barriers to trade for others coming in. But that was one of the issues even with the WTO, right? It gives this idea of, 
new companies and newly developing countries get certain preferences that they don't have to follow certain rules. So they had certain protections built in. And so the Chinese didn't violate certain things. They actually were part of the agreements that were there. So you can't fault the Chinese on some of those, right? But then there is certain behavior there, which is definitely counter to the principles of reciprocity and non-discrimination that they behave in. And one of those is, and this is the argument around, the idea was they would join the WTO and 15 years later, there's this weird like designation of a non-market economy versus a market economy. Mm -hmm. And we, we wrestled with this at Commerce. And wrestled with this at Commerce yeah. because Commerce is the one that determines whether a country is a market mm -hmm. economy or not. So when the 15 years happened in 2016, China said, I wanna be a market economy. Our 15 years are up, it's supposed to happen. The U.S. didn't recognize it, and they thought it was going to be something automatic. But what it matters around is, and Paul will be able to talk about this on the enforcement side at the end, was this idea of dumping. So the idea of dumping in trade is that you produce goods at a lower cost than it actually produces to cost, or you sell them at a, good, at a price that's lower than your actual cost of production. And so the idea is that by dumping something on the market, then you push out the other competition, and then you can then raise prices once you gain control of that aspect of the economy. So arguments around steel especially, mm -hmm. right? And you can sell at a lower price because the state is so heavily state, subsidizing that industry and so the, in a way that a U.S. government wouldn't subsidize absolutely that industry. Absolutely, right. So you right. have these subsidies that are taking place and the structure of the Chinese system allowed it to happen. And so, in, and the way that the U.S. has by and the reason why the Chinese want to be a market economy, if you're a non-market economy, well, they want to be the considered are, a market economy. Right. They don't really want to be a market right. economy. Right. They want to be considered by that designation to get the benefits of being a considered market because economy. Because the fines are actually so with the duty, the anti-dumping. There's a thing called countervailing duties, and so if you do this fine of anti-dumping, the way that you determine the countervailing duties to punish a country against for doing dumping, if you find that they're dumping, is you find a surrogate country that looks like the country that you're at and then because you know you can't rel or rely on the pricing that's taking place that the country itself so china the pricing they say is non-realistic so we would look at then say south korea or thailand or somebody else that has like different conditions that look similar but then follows the rules as a market economy and how they price and so then you do your countervailing duty or the fine basically right the punishment for that transgression based on that pricing. And the way that that pricing works out, it's much more favorable than if they were a market economy where you have to accept the pricing that the Chinese say, so they may not even get a countervailing duty, mm -hmm. right? It may not even be considered dumping. And so that right now what's actually interesting is that the Chinese are suing the United States in the WTO to be declared a market economy because one of the biggest tools that the U.S. has been using against economic tools against China has been anti-dumping, mm -hmm. um, fines and other things against the Chinese. And that's economy. still pending, right? Still pending. Yeah. So the WTO dispute is still pending review, but other countries have signed on to the U.S. side arguing against the Chinese and what they're doing. Well, I really want to take some time for questions. Hopefully there's some questions from the audience and we'll go ahead and open the floor. I think the, uh, the details on the trade aspects are right on target. Two words always come together for me. It's jobs and trade, We're where we are today in this country. Yeah. Post-World War II, the growth of middle class, a lot of reasons. We were the only kid left on the block, the unions. And in the 60s, in the early 60s, um, I had the benefit of the GI Bill. But we thought education, we knew that jobs were going to leave this country. We knew those jobs that you discussed in terms of manufacturing were going to leave the country. We thought education was going to take care of the difference, engineers, science. Um, but it would take the strength of governments to move in that direction. We never really did. I'm not talking about how much we pay in school districts and things. But the GI Bill brought people like me through school. But we never supported it. And now we have students with huge bills. We never put the money in to what should have happened in the 60s and the 70s to supplant what was going to happen that we knew it was going to happen. We saw it in the future. But you know, we deal with every two years and four years in this country. Mm -hmm. We don't deal as China does with 30, 40 years. And there is a difference. So where do we go from now? Where, where does education fit now 
in terms of trade and the loss of jobs. So, I mean, so there's a couple of ways of looking at it, right, from the education point. And, I mean, you can add to, I mean, so there's raw education, right, that we think about what we're we doing from primary years through in college. Um, and this is one of the issues I think about education today and policy is a long time ago we took away and we made VOTEC, right, vocational technical colleges or schooling a negative instead of a positive. And then the shift to everybody has to be college ready and you have to go to college and we lower different bars to it. So I think that it depends, right, as we look at the way the economy is developing and even the future of work, which is something that when we were at the Commerce Department and President Obama it was a big thing and everybody's still thinking about is, where does education fit into what the future of work is? And the idea of digital trade, which we haven't really talked about, is the manufacturing part and production, right, is still there, but digital trade is a whole nother landscape of what 21st century trade is. But with AI, all these other things that are going on, what type of education do we need is a better conversation, right, of the type of skill sets? Is it the higher order that we're doing now, tertiary, but we've still lost the whole middle class that doesn't exist in that, and what kind of skills, and again, not as a negative, but type of vocational, technical type training is the appropriate ones for people who choose to go down that pathway and what our society maybe needs and to think about how to improve that because before there were a lot of those pathways that existed and those got shut down um, along the way. And so like trade adjustment assistance was something that failed even in thinking about. So the idea of trade adjustments assistance was how do you reskill people in the wake of inevitable job losses from different trade agreements or thought of those or that would happen. So how does education fit in? I mean, it's a hard question. I mean, I don't think I fully answered, but yeah. can declare bankruptcy, but students cannot. Yep. And that's atrocious in, in a country such as ours. But aside from that, right now, the need, China has, in its universities, has, is far ahead of US universities with AI uh, research and AI teaching. Uh, for us to catch up, we're going to have to commit, invest. And it has to come from not just the private sector, it has to come from the central government and as well as states. Do you see the courage so, in this country to do that? Yeah, so mercantilism gets, I mean, so that's one of the things that's emerging, right? So this idea of even a mercantilist view, again, not seeing it as a negative, right? I mean, I'm trying, I mean, take it for what it is. This is more from the philosophical point. It's not choosing right or left or Republican or Democrat, conservative, liberal from the different, let's get rid of the labels and think about, right? The idea behind mercantilism though is state, like now we call it state industrial policy or anything else is the idea is that sometimes the market won't pick the sector that needs the growth or the area of it and you need state intervention to be able to choose it and prop it up. The internet wouldn't exist if it wasn't for the government, right? So I mean the internet, it was a government creation and then eventually the private sector was then able to take it in the way that it's taken it and to be an engine of economic growth in a different area. But so looking at where those things are, the state sometimes needs to make strategic investments and through history, the states have always, whatever country it is, have made strategic investments in different sectors of society and picked winners or losers, right? Picking winners or losers, somebody's picking them. Whether the state's picking the winners or losers or the private sector or the market is picking the winners or losers, there's winners and losers every aspect around trade. So how do you try to minimize, and this is where, again, philosophically or where you come from, some of it just comes to, yeah, I think that picking winners or losers by the state is better than picking it by the market, right? I mean, some people are gonna pick their choice, but it's a, it happens. But personally, I think that there's some things that we need to make st strategic investments by the state to support. You get back to the, I mean, academia and the government, how much was funded of academic research that used to take place that then turned into private sector uses and dual use and building something that the government started and then the private sector to take it. It's like DARPA and other things I mean, like that. DARPA, I mean, there's also efforts that even we had at Commerce Department because we're the biggest data department in the world, the amount of data that we have because National Oceanographic Administration um, and Atmospheric Administration, Commerce, I mean, Census Bureau, all these others, Bureau of Economic and Statistics is in the Commerce Department. So how do you even give that data to companies to find ways to make use of it that's valuable? And so I think there is a role in the government to make strategic investments in different ways and do it. That would be my argument. But. And it doesn't have to be anti-market either. <laughs>
Uh, can you talk about how the supply chain, manufacturing supply chains fit into international trade? Because I know in some of the recent discussions with NAFTA, it seems like people were tripping over the fact that they didn't understand even the supply chain in the automobile industry. So, so with NAFTA, right, move in on that one. So um, under the new agreement, under USMCA, so especially around automotive and this idea of supply chain, it used to be that 62.5% of a car had to be manufactured in the NAFTA region in order to be considered a North American car. Now they've upped it under the new agreement if it passes in Congress to 75% that has to be produced in there. And so the idea of supply chain, there's a few elements to it. So with mercantilism also, I just want to pause for one second and I'm going to come right back to this, is protectionism and isolationism are not the same thing. Mercantilists may be protectionists, but mercantilists are not necessarily isolationists. They still may want to engage right to the benefit of the country and still engage in trade under conditions that still make that country more powerful. That's very different than isolationism. But so on supply chain, right, is what are those elements for the added value to a product or a good and where it's becoming into the protectionist stand. So a car, right, we want to be able to have as much produced in North America because it means jobs, right? So every component of the, you know, 250 different companies because the company doesn't have it themselves. There's no longer vertical integration. There's this horizontal piece. And the idea of just-in-time production is I need to have a bunch of producers that are near me in order to then provide all those different individual components to, say, the car. So with a car, right, you want to be able to then say, okay, 75% means more jobs for us or at least within this region. So that's one way to get there. Now supply chain, though, is also a major security issue. And so the idea around security, and this is really with China as a major issue around cybersecurity and emerging technologies and digital trade, and you think about 5G technology, you see the stuff with Huawei that's taking place with the CFO being arrested in Canada and about to be extradited to the U.S. or potentially extradited. Um, but where, and this is going to be an interesting component, is the idea of national security and protectionism. Are you doing it for national security purposes or is it for protectionist purposes, right? It's like, um, was it Justice Black who was the one that said, you know, I know pornography when I see it, or I forget which one it yeah, was. Yeah, I think you're but, right. Um, my law is a little bit rusty, right? But, you know, it was like the same thing. I'll know protectionism when I see it, right, versus the other part. But there are things that are serious national security concerns, right? So China's supply chain is a major vector for the United States threat to us and our allies around the supply chain integrity of different components into the different electronics that power everything that we do, right? And so where does that become protectionist? Or even China, right? They have a state industrial policy going back to jobs and education around AI. AI and semiconductors, they're trying to build their own independent semiconductor industry because they see it also as a national security issue and don't want Intel chips or American chips or anything else because they think that those are also being used to exploit their systems. And so, Supply chain, there's many facets to where it's going in the 21st century. Um, so one about the jobs piece, then the other, though, around protectionism and national security. And national security is becoming much broader and broader mm -hmm. of a term. So in the U.S., there's this thing called the Committee on Foreign Investment in the United States, and it looks at investments that foreign companies make in the U.S. companies and the idea of stealing IP or other things, but it's getting broadened to not just be about the purchase of a company, but I mean a lot more that's being looked at and deals that are being unfolded. So when Broadcom or Qualcomm, yeah, Broadcom, the Chinese company tried to buy Qualcomm and it got shut down by CFIUS was a major um, element. We'll see a lot more of that going forward on trade um, and other countries having similar types of institutions developing. And we've justified some of the tariffs on national security grounds, yep. the administration has on steel and aluminum. Steel and aluminum. And Hey, hey, guys, thanks so much. You've laid a great base for your program, Ethan. If, if nothing else, we've learned how complex all these issues are. <laughs> um, the answer is it always depends. It, it always yeah. depends. You, sounds like, you sound like a lawyer. I don't know. It depends. By the way, Potter Stewart pornography. Potter Stewart, uh, yeah, that's what it was. Uh, Thank you. Okay. Anyone uh, need a law professor? There's, there's so many questions I have, but let me ask one question as a devil's advocate. And that is, how can we still argue that... NAFTA and other free trade agreements have had a, say, a, a, a deleterious impact on employment levels when we, in effect, have full employment today. Uh, and we see so many foreign manufacturers, foreign auto, auto manufacturers, that are building cars in the United States probably because of NAFTA. Uh, 
so, I mean, how strong is the argument that there are, at least from an employment point of view, winners and losers with free trade agreements like NAFTA? I mean, I think it's, I mean, I think it's a great point, right, that the question, though, then gets to which parts, right? Because, again, there's still some, and you look at how many have left the job market. So even though it looks like full employment, right, how many people have left the job market or are not actually actively seeking it? So it depends on which of the employment numbers that you look at. And so which ones are untrainable or non-employable and other parts. But trying to get at the direct impacts, and that's why measuring it is so hard. So anybody who says, yeah, it did or it didn't, be cautious, right? I mean, because it, again, I'm not saying it depends. There's so many factors to look at. You look at since NAFTA went into effect, what has taken place around the world and all these other pieces that have happened. And it's not like with economics and political science, these other fields that we're thinking about in politics, you can create the same vacuum you can in a basic experiment in the natural sciences. Or you can't control for friction in a vacuum that you can, right? Because you have all these different things that are there and all these variables that you don't know. But, um, there, I mean, I, yeah, this goes to personal. I'll look at the data and I can share some of the data the other part. I think that there were generally positive impacts or again, are there areas that were clearly hurt by it? Yes, um, but do I think the loss of people from the labor market I think hides what the full employment number is. Is it fair to say that some of it depends on, on what you're looking at? If you're looking at net in the, in the entire net, country, absolutely. net employment? Net actually totally But if you did. go to a place like Akron, yeah. Ohio, Youngstown, Ohio, so I think it's, it is on net, you could argue that we're at a yeah. near zero unemployment, but certainly there are pockets that are deeply, deeply affected. Well, that was like when we were trying to get TPP through, and I remember, I mean, we built on Trans-Pacific Partnership, which was the 11 country trade agreement that we tried to do with Asia and Pacific. And actually that was a political agreement as much as an economic agreement. It was meant to be part of the pivot to Asia and a counterpoint to China's growth and emergence in that region. And it was to try to solidify alliances and increase the economic counterbalance to China. It was a lost opportunity, right? If we think China is a, you know, not in the same interests that we have, right? And not a um, following the rules of the system as exist, right? And so um, when we were trying to make the case for different members of Congress, I mean, it was a targeted, I mean, like mm -hmm. we were coming up with every benefit and trying to come up with for every district what jobs were created or what jobs it will create and telling stories and trying to get around that. And I mean, and it was hard because of exactly that. Which ones lost something? It was like, mm -hmm. my constituents aren't gonna buy that. This is mm -hmm. what they say, right? And, and all of that ultimately also led to, right, the rise of Bernie Sanders and Donald Trump, right? Mm -hmm. And now where we're at of the other part, I mean, it's two sides of the same coin, right? Populism has been growing. There's certain parts of these things have led to, and you can look at just right through history, when people have economic insecurities, when it leads to political insecurity, right? Mm -hmm. And there are a lot of people, as much as that we may discount because of different elements, there's certain economic secure insecurity that is felt across a range of people around, not just in the United States, across the globe, right? Because of these, and they see at least trade as at least the f easiest thing to look at. Whether it's accurate or not, and there's different points that you can make about it, it's the thing that stands out the most about it, right, mm -hmm. of um, where that happened. Do we have any and questions from students? students? Are there any students that have questions? I'm gonna be sure we get some student questions. Uh, yeah, so kind of building off of uh, the TPP uh, discussion, um, with the, uh, and, broader, and more broadly, the Asia pivot, um, with the collapse of the TPP, at least the U.S.-led version uh, in 2016 and the election of Donald Trump, uh, it kind of was a end of the era of the Asia pivot, a more collective uh, strategy to check China uh, through kind of diplomatic, uh, political, economic means. Uh, what are the larger global ramifications since 2016 um, with that type of policy um, that has been pursued with the Trump administration? and how have both the United States been impacted and the Asia partners that were kind of banking on this broader uh, proposal? Yeah. So, so, trying to, I mean, and staying apolitical in this, that uh, try to give it from, you know, just trying to call ball a ball and a strike a strike down this one is TPP, and also there was an adjacent one that was also negotiating at the same time with Europe called the Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership. So the idea was also to build one between the US and Europe of a free trade agreement with very similar structure. So also besides the argument of the Asia pivot was to use these two regional trade agreements because there were certain things that had labor um, um, 
protections in there, environmental protections. There was also issues around digital trade that were in there, intellectual property protections. There was a thing called investor state dispute resolution or settlement, which was a taken off in different ways. But the idea was to create a higher bar and standard for future trade agreements as well, because everybody saw Doha failed, and how do you bring others? And the idea was, okay, you sign up to these two in these two major regions of the world, you're welcome to join them, but you just have to agree to the terms of it. So it was a way to sort of get around multilateral agreements that weren't working. So if you can set between Europe, Asia, these two major trade agreements that cover these two major continents of it, then it was open to anybody to join. Like China was open to join TPP if they wanted to, but under the rules that it was agreed to, right? And then it would have been the same on the other side. So one was to set new standards at a higher standard of towards a fairer trade was part of the argument. Around the second point, though, of the issue of the administration, I think this gets to where we were saying earlier is when TPP failed, that was the point. So this was pre-Trump. That was, and that was back in 2014 when it failed, or 15. Um, but because there was a couple of stages to what had to happen. First, trade promotion authority, which is this idea of fast track authority, had expired. Do you want to explain yeah. what trade promotion authority yeah. is? So in order to negotiate those agreements, you needed a thing, and this is going back to 1932. Congress gave up part of its authority over trade agreements because Congress used to set tariff rates. And they would, I mean, they would give parameters to the president around negotiating with other countries. Then there was a thing called, in 1932, the Reciprocal Trade Agreement Act. And the Reciprocal Trade Agreement Act, Congress gave up part of its authority, and this idea of fast-track authority came into being. Congress would give the president the authority to negotiate and then give them parameters around the negotiation, but then Congress only gets an up-or-down vote, 50% plus one, so 51 votes in the Senate instead of two-thirds majority for a treaty. The idea was to empower the executive to have more bargaining power vis-a-vis -vis the countries they were negotiating with in order to get to this idea of reciprocity and non-discrimination in the way going forward. And so that's continued forward with this idea of fast-track authority. It's given by Congress, but it then also disappears. When President Obama was in the middle, because President Bush actually started negotiating TPP and then it passed over to President Obama, Fast Track Authority ended under the end of the Bush administration, so there were certain things that had to come back for President Obama. And so the Democrats were at the time also had strong ability to control this. They ended up getting some concessions in order to give them trade promotion authority in order to get more trade adjustment assistance, the idea of how do you retrain and reskill. It seemed that that was the step to get enough Democrats on board because since it passed, then it would hopefully help for TPP but he lost too many Democrats because it also got defeated for President Obama of Democrats and Republicans who used to be pro-trade, whether it was in order to either stick it to President Obama for their own political purposes, or just again, this philosophical shift that was happening in both parties, which we still see today is, that's really when TPP failed for President Obama and he couldn't get it through a Republican controlled Senate that had the majority to be able to do it, even without the number of Democrat votes that they needed, that ended sort of, that's where this shift towards anti-trade mm -hmm. block has now, and the two parties converging on that, has sort of emerged. So with Donald Trump, I mean, in the administration and the other part, put the rhetoric aside. So there are certain things that you have to put rhetoric aside on both sides of the aisle or whichever political side that you're on. And actually, it's not far off for where the trajectory was of these different trade policies that existed. And so even if it wasn't President Trump, I think that very similar policies would be taking place with a different rhetorical spin to it. And so I don't think that it's all necessarily President Trump. I think that where this alignment and this different views of trade are, there was a trajectory that it was going on and we wouldn't be in a very much different place no matter who would be sitting in the White House today. And talk about where opinion, TPP but. is now, what happened after the US withdrew from TPP. So President yeah. Trump, withdraws the U.S. from TPP on his third day in office. What happens at the agreement and the remaining countries? Yeah, so, the, so Canada, Japan get together. They say we're still going to go forward with it. They renegotiated a few different parts of it. They've signed it. Still isn't fully in effect yet because I think all the ratifications haven't taken place, but I've lost a little bit track of it. And then um, they've said the U.S. is welcome to join, but they can't negotiate any different. They have to just join it in the form it was, mm -hmm. which was what the original principle around TPP was. But there isn't even any talk in the union. U.S. right now in the current administration mm -hmm. to even consider joining TPP.
whoever's got the mics. Yeah. Hearing so much stuff that's really fascinating and having trouble absorbing it all and sorting it out and compartmentalizing it so my brain can process it. A few weeks ago, or no, a few days ago, in the Wall Street Journal, they were touting a book as they do on, as they do on their um, op-ed page on the right-hand side. They usually have a book that they're promoting for whatever interest it might have. But this book, and I can't remember the author or the name of it, but it kind of was uh, stating that, you know, a market economy, a consumer economy, at some point as we go into the future without, with zero population or less growth, uh, th this isn't going to work forever. This is going to collapse at some point. And I, I can't explain, you know, the, the exact reasons. I haven't read the book yet, but uh, if anybody recalls seeing that, maybe somebody else can uh, give, give us some thoughts about that. But you can't just grow exponentially forever. And maybe that's a long way you don't worry about it. I don't know. That's right. I mean, so, so that prediction has been there for a very long time, right, going back to Marx and others, right, that eventually it would collapse on itself. Um, and whether that's the case, if we're seeing strains, right, to what there could be, consumption, right, there is some point of consumption, which is why you need trade, right, to have, where for the United States, we're 5% of the global economy in terms of number of consumers. There's 95% of a world market that's out there that isn't consuming. So for a long time, it's sort of like oil peak, I would argue, is oil peak has continued to push on and peak oil hasn't been reached and we keep finding new discoveries of it. There's new consumers that are out there and when that point will be, then eventually, yes, it will collapse. And, and if we throw in some of the variables like climate matters that are going on, extraordinary storms and, and you know, more uh, volcanic activity, everything that's affecting some very large populations, then, you know, we're are we are we managing at all to anticipate and work together on those levels? Apparently not from listening to our politicians. So. I think that's one of the challenges. So I guess Thanks. this is more of a philosophical question. You mentioned mercantilism being sort of the reflection and reinforcement of world power in a, on a global stage. So with sort of the reorienting of, of trade policy now, you look at, I think, the 2017 National Security Strategy, one of the pillars is um, sort of reorienting our involvement in international institutions to benefit the United States. So to me, that kind of seems like maybe a progression or maybe a regression back towards mercantilism. So would you say that this, that's kind of what this is? Is this mercantilism? Or do you think it's more of just a populist appeal to those 350,000 auto workers that got laid off? Is it more political or? or? So some, some will argue that all the institu international institutions, whether it's today or it was back in Bretton Woods, were all built anyway for our own interest, right? And so it's evolved that the way that others are and the way that the playing field has changed, we need to rewrite the rules to continue to keep ourselves at the benefit of it, right? And so within those, and even from, you know, again, a liberal or a mercantilist standpoint, those rules that will enable us to and continue to improve, whether it's zero sum or non-zero sum, we would still like to either have the most absolute gains possible from a liberal standpoint or the most relative gains from a realist or another standpoint, right? From the mercantilist side, though, where the reorientation around those are for the institutions, I would say is how do we get out of the trade deficit point is a big issue because for mercantilists, a trade surplus is what matters, right? A trade deficit is a threat to the state's power. And so in part of doing that and the reordering of some of those institutions is in a way to restructure those agreements where we're not the ones who, I mean, President Trump regularly, right, talks about or his, um, or um, Robert Lighthizer, his USTR, or Peter Navarro, his trade advisor, right, all highlight the trade deficit as a problem. And that's one of the things, right, in NAFTA they wanted to correct is to get rid of the trade deficit with Mexico. He only wants trade surpluses. Is that very mercantilist in the language? Does he know that's mercantilist? Hey, that's for anybody else to make their judgment of what he knows or doesn't. But, um, but that is the language of what would be a mercantilist. We've got time for one more question. Nope. <laughs> Can we do two? Or yeah, we, I, I, together, we do two. Or? Let's just do them two back to back. So. And then Scott will answer whichever one <laughs> is easier. Uh, I would love to hear just a little bit more about the impact of currency and the international exchange regime on trade. Uh, and particularly in regards to the WTO, uh, you talked so much about how the international community is taking umbrage at China's dumping policies, and it just reminded me 
all the articles I've read about China's currency manipulation antics, I guess you'd call it, how does the WTO deal with such an important part of the international economy that has such, I feel, a direct impact on the trade of products, even if it doesn't have as direct of an authority on those kind of things. I mean, so that's, I mean, it's an interesting part because that was the idea of going back to Brenton Woods and having the role of the IMF around currency exchange and these issues to keep the stability of the different markets. And then you had the WTO to focus on trade. Trade, WTO has actually no authority over that issue of currency itself. So currency manipulation as a point of a violation of any WTO rules, it wouldn't. So then a country, if on their own, the U.S. says they're doing it, do they do some treatment against that? Potentially they would, right? But then could China even sue in the WTO saying that it was an unfair tariff that was in place for a reason that doesn't violate those rules? The IMF, though, in the sense of exchange rate stability, it's interesting because the IMF changed drastically in 1974. So the IMF used to push that the whole point was there are certain things that you could have around money. You can have either independence or um, exchange rate stability, and there's different parts that tie into the banking structure. Um, but it was all about fixed exchange rates before. So when the IMF was created in 47, it was how do you fix exchange rates? And there was a peg to the dollar and because the dollar was on the gold standard. And so the idea was that that's what created stability amongst regimes and the exchange rates that were out there. Then when gold started getting pressure from it after OPEC and other issues, and then so petrodollars that were going against it, and then President Nixon left the gold standard in 1974, then it went to the idea that you need to float money. And the idea that the best way to actually control exchange rates is let the market determine what the value is, and you should float that. So then where currency manipulation comes in, would be the argument that then if a state has a pegged rate or is doing something on that scale where they choose to keep it artificially low or high in order to impact their prices on trade. So if you have a high currency, then it ends up making your goods, right? Um, so I'm gonna just make sure that I state it correctly because sometimes I you know, flip it as I'm going too quickly, right? Is that if your currency is overvalued, right? What does it do to those goods? Makes it cheaper or more expensive for others? Overvalued. This is the West Point professor yeah. coming out. Yeah. <laughs> right, so the goods are, right, if it's overvalued, right, then for them, it makes their goods more expensive for others to do. If they undervalue their currency, right, it makes their goods cheaper for others to be able to then be able to absorb. Right, so then if you're keeping it undervalued against the U.S. dollar, then you're able to sell more goods to the U.S. than you should if it was at the market rate. So that's the idea of the currency manipulation piece. So China, though, being pushed on it, they have floated within a ban and tried to get rid of that narrative, and they've made it more towards the market rate, even though they still control some of it. But others can argue, too, that the U.S. and the way that we did quantitative easing to make the dollar cheaper relative to others, even though the market determined it, by flooding the market with dollars, we actually manipulated our currency post the Great Recession in order to make our goods cheaper to other markets as well. So that's why currency manipulation is a hard thing to get at, because it can be a double-edged sword because then those tools that you use, even though independently we did it because the central bank in the U.S. is independent from the other choice around our monetary policy, but quantitative easing um, was, as well as TARP, right? It devalued our dollar um, to make our goods cheaper for others to purchase, which then increased our manufacturing jobs because President Obama, one of his goals that he set when he came in office in 2008 was to double the U.S. number of, or double the size of U.S. manufacturing, the number of sales that we had, and he almost doubled exports, but it wasn't necessarily because of job creation, it was because our dollar was, arguably, right, was that our dollar was undervalued for a while. TARPA, that was a troubled asset relief program yes. that it w came in in 2009. Or it was the, not TARP, sorry, it was the, um, the other one that we did, the big spend package. Um, I forgot what the, stimulus. Called, so the stimulus. The package, stimulus. The stimulus package. Sorry. Sorry, flight, not jet lag, but flight. I'll use that as my excuse. Well, hopefully we piqued your interest. Yeah. Uh, we've got some really great sessions coming up. The next six sessions, I think, are going to be incredibly fascinating. I think this is laid, thank, thank you to Scott for laying what is, I think, a really great groundwork for us to kind of reach uh, a little bit of understanding of these complex issues, and we've got some great guests coming up in the next six sessions to build off what Scott has set out today. So I really appreciate everybody being here. I hope to see you again next week. We're going to have another exciting guest and, and continue on.
exploring what I think is, is a really interesting topic. So thank you for spending part of your Wednesday with us. Thank you.